Well, today's lesson is really on a sensitive subject that may be difficult for some people to, you know, to listen to for various, uh, various reasons. Some people may disagree with me on various ideas and conclusions that I've come to about this topic, and that's okay, you know, we, we have to share our opinions here. Uh, some may have to relive personal situations that were painful because we're talking about divorce and uh, these type of things, and uh, we might have to kind of relive some of the emotions of those times as I talk about this. There may have been some who realize that they are wrong, have to have the, you know, after listening to this lesson, may have to make some adjustments as to what you think about this particular topic. And many may simply be relieved to hear that certain things they just knew to be true in their hearts have finally been proven or demonstrated to be so uh, uh, with uh, a good a Bible uh, teaching base. And others, of course, uh, have seen the weakness in their relationships that may, you know, that may take some time to fix. So whenever we talk about marriage and divorce, whenever we, we talk about marriage courses, how to improve relationships, a lot of times it means that uh, we have to examine our relationship and uh, that's not always, an, uh, not always an easy thing. So I'm just telling you this to know that I, I feel for you. I understand what you may be going through as you're listening and taking in these uh, lessons. Anyways, whatever our feelings, uh, I hope that this lesson will help you, uh, will widen your knowledge, will increase your love for yourself, of course, and for those who struggle with marriage, with divorce, and especially the topic I'm going to talk about uh, this morning, uh, the issue of remarriage. And uh, after the lesson, you know, my goal is that you, you always love God more, love yourself. Uh, in this particular context, love your partner more, love your spouse more uh, at every stage of the game. Now, this lesson is entitled Remarriage and Renewal, and it addresses the concerns that people who are in subsequent marriages or those who are about to remarry have. And we don't usually talk about that in the church. You know, we, we talk about what you shouldn't do and what you need to avoid and, you know, and so on and so forth. But the truth is that people do get divorced and people do remarry. And we don't talk about the people who remarry. You know, um, people who have gone through a divorce and then uh, after a time, uh, whatever time period, decide to remarry, I mean, those people, they want to succeed at those marriages. They want to do well. You know, pe people who have suffered through a divorce, they never want to go through that again. That's you know, one thing I have found in my experience, people who have what we call subsequent marriage, a subsequent marriage is a second marriage for whatever reason, whether you're a widower or a divorcee, a subsequent marriage is, is your second, your third marriage, whatever the, whatever the situation is. I've never met anyone uh, that uh, at whether it was their first marriage or second marriage who wanted to fail at that. Everybody wants to succeed, everybody wants to have a good marriage, whether it's the first time they're marrying or a, a subsequent marriage. So I've, I've taught at length about marriage and divorce in, in, in my career, and um, I, I, I've come to certain conclusions as to what the Bible teaches about this. So a couple of things here that we need to uh, look at, just some basis, basic ideas. First of all, marriage is between one man and one woman for life. That's the standard, that's the ideal that's established in Genesis and reinforced in the New Testament. Another idea in the Bible is that divorce is a sin. Period, that's, that's what it is, it's a sin. And if unrepented of, will you know, damn the soul to hell, just like any other sin. You steal, you don't repent, you know, you'll be condemned. You murder, uh, you kill someone, you don't repent, you know, you'll be condemned. I mean, from, you know, on a spiritual uh, level. You lie, you cheat, you, whatever. Well, in the same way, you divorce, that's a sin. If you don't repent, you'll be condemned because of that sin. Another thing uh, that I've taught is that adultery, divorce, failure at marriage can be repented of, can be forgiven, and the guilty 
as well as the innocent, uh, can receive uh, encouragement and forgiveness and renewal from God. You know, we've treated uh, you know, divorced people as people who have committed the unpardonable sin. They can't be forgiven for that. For the rest of their lives, you know, they have to go around with the big D on them. You know, I'm a divorced person. I'm less than good. I'm less than okay. And that's, that's not biblical. That's, that's not the gospel. You know, I, I, I ask you to think about the, uh, the story or the parable of the prodigal son. Very interesting parable. And I think everybody knows the parable. The son, the younger son goes away, wastes his father's inheritance on wild living and comes to his senses, realizes he's going to go back home, just ask his father to treat him like a slave, doesn't, doesn't deserve any better than that. And what happens? What happens to the prodigal? The father embraces him, the father puts a, a ring on his finger to demonstrate or to, 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 to uh, uh, to underline the fact that he's, he's gotten his position back in the family, the ring. And he puts a, 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 a robe on, on him to tell him that he, he has uh, access to the material uh, wealth of the family again. And he puts sandals on his feet to show that he is not a slave. He's not going to be treated as a slave. The slaves, you know, they, they, wore, they were barefoot, but he has sandals, so the father's not going to treat him as a slave, but to me the most significant thing that has happened or that happens in that parable is that the father kills the fatted calf and has a celebration. And the significance of that is the father gives back to the son. The, the son comes and repents and the father gives back to him his position in the family, the access to the wealth of the family, uh, uh, the freedom in the family, but also gives him the right to be happy again, the right to rejoice. He gives him back the right to uh, rejoice and be happy once again. He doesn't have to go around you know, with, the, with the, you know, the prodigal, the big P. He doesn't have to go around with, yes, I'm the loser son. I'm the one that did that. I'll never be okay. I shouldn't have too much fun. I shouldn't smile. I shouldn't have any joy because I've got to just carry this burden my whole life. That's not what the father does. He gives him back his life. And the idea with forgiveness, as far as God is concerned, is when He forgives us, He renews us. And in renewal, He gives us back all the things that we have lost. And so that's the point I make about those who have failed in, in marriage. Um, uh, when they repent of this sin, God gives them back. He renews them, gives them back all the things that they have lost because of their sin. Another point that I want to make about you know, marriage and divorce, so on and so forth, is that I don't believe the Bible teaches that uh, dissolving a legally contracted marriage, whether it's a second marriage or third marriage or whatever, and then you know, going back to your original partner, uh, some people teach that. I, I don't believe the Bible actually teaches that. That's not what God requires of us as far as repentance is concerned. Repentance requires an acknowledgement of the sin. And when it comes to divorce, the sin is, well, the putting away, the breaking of the covenant. That's the sin. So repentance requires that we acknowledge what we've done. You know, I broke the covenant. I put away. I did the things that caused that. I acknowledge that, that I am guilty of that. And then repentance requires a change of heart concerning the things that led to the sin, whether it was selfishness, self-centeredness, uh, greed, lust, whatever was working inside the individual that brought them to that point, those things are going to change. That's what repentance is. Now, when reconciliation is possible you know, in a couple, I always encourage this. But when other marriages have been contracted after the divorce, I believe the best course of action is to follow Paul's teaching in such matters. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7.20, let each man remain in that condition in which he was called. So you know, it's an old story, you, know, you can't unscramble the egg. So you can't unscramble these relationships once they are set, especially if they're in a, a, legal, a legal format. So, Getting remarried does not remove God from our lives. 
Some people think, you know, oh, my second marriage is not a God. My first one was the godly one. My second one is the ungodly one. No, that's, that's incorrect. Marriage, by its very nature, is a call to God to help us live in the way that He had originally designed us to live. One man and one woman. You know, the person who gets married a second time, you know, the, it's still one man trying to be married to one woman and making it work. And we need God to help us make those relationships work. So those who remarry have failed at this at some point in their lives for whatever reason, and they're trying to get it right. And so to those people, this is the advice I give to those who have remarried. Number one, realize that you are really married. I mean, you're really married. Some think that a subsequent marriage is not the, it's not the real thing. You know, they're not godly marriages or they're not as good as the first marriage or God is displeased, you know, He won't help you. Or for some reason or other, this marriage is some sort of adultery. You know, these thoughts are based on the idea that marriages cannot be dissolved and before God you're always married to your first spouse as long as they're alive. That's where this idea comes from. My marriage is not good, my marriage is adultery. You know, the, there's this idea, this indissolubility of marriage idea. And uh, the idea is, well, here's God up here and here's the, you know, the man and the woman and when they marry, you know, they make a covenant and, they marry, and there's this triangle. And even if the, you know, the, the a divorce breaks the two up here, they're still married in the eyes of God. Now, this idea of the indissolubility of marriage, meaning it's impossible to be you know, divorced in the eyes of God, this is a Roman Catholic idea. We, we didn't come up with this idea. This idea crept into our thinking from other sources. It's a Roman Catholic idea. It actually began at the Council of Trent in 1545. And the, the, the doctrine that was developed at the Council of Trent said that only God can marry you and only God can unmarry you. That's why in the Catholic Church you had things such as an annulment of marriage. You had to get papal permission you know, to actually be divorced in the eyes of God since the Pope was you know, God or rather Jesus' representative on earth. That's where all of this comes from. Now I have explained in the past in other lessons that Death is what dissolves a marriage in a righteous way, Romans chapter 7. And divorce also di di dissolves a marriage, but it does it in an unrighteous way. The result is the same. You know, the marriage is dissolved. If your partner dies, the, you're no longer married to that partner, but there's no sin. You see what I'm saying? Uh, there's no sin uh, uh, in that particular way to dissolve a marriage. If, however, the marriage is dissolved through divorce, the marriage is still dissolved, but there's sin there. There's a reason uh, that that marriage is, uh, has been uh, dissolved, and the cause of it is usually sin, cheating, lying, whatever. But the thing we have to remember is that either way, the marriage is dissolved. The Bible never refers to a subsequent marriage as adultery. Basically, the Bible says you must not divorce because it's a sin. It goes against what God says. It doesn't say you can't divorce, like it can't happen. It just says you mustn't do it, just like it says you mustn't steal. It doesn't mean that people will never steal. It just says if you steal, it's a sin. You see what I'm saying? You mustn't commit adultery. Does it mean people can never commit adultery? No, it just means God doesn't want us to do that. But do people still do that? Yeah. And when they do, they sin. Well, in the same way, God said, you must not dissolve your marriages. He didn't say you can't dissolve them, like it's an impossible thing. He just said, you mustn't do that. Because if you do, you will sin in the same way. So subsequent marriages, you know, second marriages or more, are not first marriages, we understand that, but they are marriages in God's eyes as well as society's eyes. You, know, you marry for the second time, you're married legally in the, in the eyes of society and you are also married in the eyes of, of God. 
And the point I'm trying to make this morning here on this is that God will help you with these marriages if you ask Him. Society, including the family, must also respect what God respects. Now Jesus tells us to forgive you know, 70 times seven, right? When Peter asked him, how many times should I forgive? Three times? Jesus, no, no, 70 times seven. That's the attitude of God. That's how God wants us to be uh, generous and open and gracious and forgiving. Well, if Jesus tells us to forgive 70 times seven, surely God can forgive one failed marriage and help a person get it right if they are willing the second time, the subsequent time. You know, when you are legally married, you are bound by man and God to be faithful. You're bound by man and God to do your best to succeed in remaining married until death do you part. Because you're really married to this and only to this one person, whether it be a first marriage or a second marriage, for whatever reason, you are married to that person. It may have begun you know, in a rocky way and so on and so forth, but this is the person you're married to and God will help you succeed because in the end that's what He wants. He wants you to succeed. Number two, things I want to say to those who are remarried. Number two, your marriage is perfect because of the cross of Jesus Christ. You know, if you were a non-Christian and you were divorced and then remarried, you would be legally married to the second person, but your soul would be charged with the sin of adultery because you divorced. When a person divorces without cause, the sin that they commit is called adultery. You know? If I take something that doesn't belong to me, what is that sin called? It's called stealing. If I say things in anger and I take you know, uh, 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 I use a vulgar language. What's that sin called? It's called cursing. Well, if I have a covenant, you know, a marriage covenant with a person and I break that covenant, what is that sin called? It's called adultery. Because in the Bible, adultery doesn't just refer to sexual activity. It also refers to the violation of a covenant. So when you break the covenant and divorce, that's the legal term, what is that sin called? Well, it's called adultery. So if a non-Christian divorces, the sin charged to his soul, her soul, is the sin of adultery. Even if you legally divorce and you remarry 10 times, each time the sin of adultery would be charged to your soul. 10 sins. You only need one to be condemned, but you'd have 10 of them. At death, the world would bury a much married person. Wow, he was married 10 times. But they would not hold anything against you because everything was done legally. Nobody would you know, say, wow, he was, a, he was a lawbreaker. No, no, if you married and divorced 10 times, you did it legally, they'd say, wow, he sure got married and divorced a lot of times. But you wouldn't be charged with a crime because it was legal. That's what the Pharisees were doing in Jesus' time. They were putting away their wives for whatever reason. That's why they asked Jesus, you know, is it okay to divorce for any reason? Now this person here, this, this non-believer, you know, married, divorced 10 times and buried, society wouldn't charge him with any crime, but God would condemn him to hell because he would be guilty of adultery, not because he remarried, the sin doesn't get charged to him you know, because he got remarried. It's because of the broken covenant. He broke you know, the covenant over and over again. Those sins, that's what would be charged to him. All right, now I'm saying this to say the following. The person who becomes a Christian, even though he may be divorced and remarried, is forgiven for his adultery and thus made perfect in God's sight just like he's forgiven for his stealing and he's forgiven for his cursing and he's forgiven for whatever sins there are against him, God forgives him. Now, the Christian who divorces and repents is also forgiven for his sin of adultery. See what I'm saying? 
You know, many find this hard to accept, but God's grace does not make a distinction about which sins to forgive and which sins not to forgive. When a person becomes a Christian or when a Christian repents, all of the sin is forgiven, whatever the sin is. Now, of course, the repentance requires a change of heart and a change of attitude, but what makes the person perfect in God's sight is not how he or she is able to fix his former marriage, as some teach. It's not how well he succeeds in his subsequent marriage. I mean, repentance requires that you try, you change the bad things that you were doing that led to that sin. That's what repentance requires. But being perfect in God's sight and even being perfect in the, uh, in the area of marriage, this is a free gift given to a person who believes in Jesus and expresses that belief in repentance and baptism and then in faithful living. Every sin is taken care of by the cross of Christ. There are no exceptions to that. So regardless of your marital status, God makes you perfect through the cross of Christ, not through your relative success in uh, marital relationships. Very important. For those who are here, who are those who are watching this on video, whatever, if you have a divorce in your past, that divorce is taken care of by the cross of Christ. That particular sin and all the sins that led up to it, that's taken care of by the cross of Jesus Christ. Your repentance is not trying to fix that by going back to the first person you ever married or you know, living like a eunuch. You know, the, 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 the atonement, the restitution, you know, the making up for those mistakes, for those failures, for those sins, Jesus does that. He makes restitution, even for your marital mistake. He makes restitution for that on the cross. Your repentance requires you to do the very best you can now to go forward and not repeat those mistakes. Another thing I want to tell people uh, as far as uh, you know, who have uh, subsequent marriage, um, follow the Bible's advice for the remarrieds. You know, you'd say, wow, I didn't know there was advice in the Bible for remarrieds. You know, I know that there isn't a chapter, as I say, in the Bible addressed to people who are remarried. You know, wouldn't it be nice? Then you could be sure that God loves you and includes you in His family. But there's a lot of advice for people who have failed. And isn't that what divorce and remarriage is all about? It's about failure. We failed at something and we're, we're trying again to succeed. You know, weak and sinful people who have failed at a complex and demanding relationship and who are trying again. Why is it that we are so gracious to those who have failed at telling the truth or failed at believing in Jesus, uh, failed at killing, you know, not killing other people? We're gracious with them, you know, the, the serial killers who find Christ and are about, we're so gracious with them, but we lack so much compassion for those who had failed at marriage. Why, why is that? God is kind and patient towards all those who fail and are willing, with His help, to try again. And so to these, He promises help and advice in His word. So the basic advice for those who fail is the following. Number one, forget the past. Forget it. The past is where the failure is, where the pain is. Let the past go. If a person is forgiven by God, they can forgive themselves and then turn away from the past. That's what I tell people. You, 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 you can't forgive yourself until God forgives you, but when God forgives you, then you can forgive yourself. Dwelling on what happened, what might have you know, been done differently, why it all happened, this is not going to change the past. It will only keep the past alive in the present. And that goes for the guilty and the victims. 
you know, when I talk about the guilty and the victim, you know, maybe there's one more guilty. I've never, as I said before, I've never seen in a marriage 100% guilt on one part, 0% guilt on the other. There's usually enough guilt to go around, but sometimes one person bears a greater responsibility for having broken the, the relationship than the other person. But I say to both people, to the victim and to the guilty one, right, the innocent and the guilty, both of them have to kind of forget the past. Both of them have to. Trying to fix the past by punishing ourselves, by punishing our ex-partner, by bargaining with God, only manages to delay the healing. Some people, you know, they don't want to heal because constant pain is their way of trying to atone for past failure in marriage. They just want to keep whipping themselves. If they heal, then they have nothing to offer their conscience or God and are afraid of the punishment. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, you know, God wants to heal you. And most of the time that you don't get healed is because you don't want to heal. You want to keep offering up your pain to God as some sort of atonement, some sort of sacrifice. And I'm saying to you, the sacrifice that heals you is the cross of Jesus Christ, except His atonement. Accept his pain offered for your mistake and your failure and move on. You know, Paul, the apostle, in speaking of his former life and the terrible failure in his former life, says the following. He says, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 3. Verse 13 and 14. You know, Paul the Apostle had been forgiven and the way that he forgave himself is that he refused to dwell on the failure he had, uh, that he had been absolved of and concentrated on the future that God had freely offered him. You know, there may be some sort of morbid satisfaction always dwelling on the past and Paul had a past, let's face it, a violent past violent persecution against the church. He had ruined families. You, know, you ever think uh, about Paul, the persecution that he made while he was an apostle? Many of the people he threw in jail may have still been in jail. I don't see anywhere in the New Testament where he went back to apologize. He went and you know, crusaded to get people out of jail. No. You know, God gave him something to do which would you know, eventually help the people that he had hurt. But he didn't go back. He went forward. He went forward. So he had been forgiven and the way he forgave himself was by going forward. So forgetting the past is not only healthy, but it is the ongoing way that we express our faith to God, believe it or not. As I go forward with my life, I'm saying to God, I trust you and I have faith that you've taken care of this thing for me. And I'm, I'm going to go forward now. And me going forward is my way of saying, I believe you and I trust you. Forgetting the past says, I believe that you have forgiven me and I focus on you, Lord, and no longer focus on my failure. That's why you have to move forward. It says to God, I accept the fact that you've healed me, you've taken care of me, you've paid for that terrible wrong that I've done in the past, whatever, and I'm moving forward and I accept what you've given me. Just like the prodigal son accepted the ring and the robe and the sandals, you know, he accepted it and he went to the, uh, to the feast and participated. Another thing I say to those who are uh, remarried, learn from the past, you know, forget the past and learn from it. The fact the past is there, the failure, whether it's our fault or somebody else's fault or a mixture of both, the past is there, it's history. And there are a lot of reminders of that history. The key is not to whine about the past or dwell and mourn over the past, but to use it by learning from it so that it can help us with today. You know, repentance is a change of heart. The past helps us understand where we were and what we need to do in order to repent. That's the only reason I look at the past is I'm reminded of what I did in the past that I don't want to do again. What we contributed to the failure, we need to change. 
We need to control it. We need to improve it. We need to eliminate it. We need to replace it. That's the reason I look at the past, just to examine, okay, what were the mistakes that I made? What were the attitudes that need to be changed? And so on and so forth. The past usually shows us that our failure was due to the fact that we did it our way. Repentance means that in the future, we're going to do it God's way. Now, many second marriages fail because the people, whether they're guilty or innocent, enter into them with the same attitude that they had in the first marriage. As a matter of fact, many fail because so many issues remain unresolved and we end up beating our second spouses up for the things that our original spouse did. Now, this is a, a sad commentary. This is why second marriages fail at the same rate as first marriages fail. And they shouldn't. You, know, you figure you learned something. So my advice to divorce people is to get counseling so that you can learn from the past who you are and why you failed and so on and so forth before entering into another serious relationship. Getting married again doesn't solve problems from the first marriage. They need to be solved before getting married again because subsequent marriages bring in a whole new set of problems. You've got some of the problems from the first relationship and, and some brand new ones as well. So if you've learned something from the past, you will be better equipped to deal with the future. And then one other thing, let your life and change be a witness for Jesus Christ. You know, Paul the Apostle often began his sermons with the story of his conversion. And the storyline was usually how a person who despised Christians grew to love the church so much that he was ready to die for it. That was his witness. Now, if you base your marriage on biblical principles, if you live your life as a faithful and fruitful Christian, if people see that it's possible to take a failed life, a failed marriage, and through Jesus Christ build a new life and a new and wonderful marriage, who do you think will be glorified? Well, I believe you know, Jesus will be glorified. God will be glorified by this. Jesus said, let your light shine before men in such a way that they see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven, Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. A loving relationship, a Christian home, these are good works, even if they are produced by a subsequent marriage. They will honor God and they will provide a witness for the power of Christ in your life. What a tremendous witness that someone can see from someone who has failed at marriage for whatever reason, and then as time goes by, their character, their attitude, things change, they get into a subsequent marriage, and all of a sudden, they get it right. They're a tremendous witness for Christ. They're doing things the right way, raising children relationship-wise, serving the church, their personal growth. Who can deny that that is a witness of Christ, that you bear the fruit of the Spirit, that you rejoice in your new relationship, that your family is exemplary uh, before others. Who can deny that God is working in your life? So you know, I tell people with substance, don't mope around with your head down all the time being ashamed. You know, stand up. You can make a great witness for Christ. Only Satan wants us to you know, look down and mope around and feel guilty all the time. God has sent His Son to forgive our sins and to give us an, a new life, an abundant life. We need to believe that. We need to put that into practice in our lives. So let's kind of summarize some of these comments this morning. Jesus you know, came to save. He came to build, to encourage, to equip. He didn't come to judge or punish or criticize us. I mean, there'll be a judgment, all right. That's in the future. If you failed at marriage for whatever reason, um, regardless of the times, I say to you, ask Jesus to forgive you and forget the past mistakes and allow Christ to teach you how to succeed. 
and offer your new success to Him as a sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise. You know, the prodigal son, I, I would think that he was a pretty hard worker in his father's fields after he came back. I would think that he, he would see every single day in his father's house a day of rejoicing, a day of great satisfaction. I would see that young man grow uh, as one who is quite thankful to his father and to, 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 to his God for the wonderful thing that had taken, had taken place in his life. And I, I like to see that in a, in, a, in a subsequent marriage, people who see the great chance that God has given them, a second chance, a wonderful opportunity that nothing on earth can give them, only the Spirit of Christ, only the cross of Christ can make real. So God is interested in renewal, He's interested in rebirth, He's interested in regeneration, and this is true in marriage as well as every other area of our lives. Well, I hope this lesson helps you and encourages you. I hope you share it with uh, others. We'll continue in our series in Love for Life, building or rebuilding a great marriage. We'll see you next time. Thanks.